Then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll, and go, speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he fed me this scroll. He said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not being sent to a people of unintelligible speech or difficult language, but to the house of Israel, nor to many peoples of unintelligible speech or difficult language whose words you cannot understand. But I have sent you to them who should listen to you, Yet the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, since they are not willing to listen to me. Surely the whole house of Israel is stubborn and obstinate. Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery, harder than flint, I have made your forehead do not be afraid of them, or be dismayed before them, though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, take into your heart all my words, which I will speak to you and listen closely. Go to the exiles, to the sons of your people, and speak to them and tell them whether they listen or not. Thus says the Lord God. Let's now turn to John chapter 20. This morning we look at verses 19 through 23. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Lord, we thank you today for your word, and thank you for this event as our risen Savior appeared to his disciples. Bless this word to us and use it to feed our souls and to equip us to serve. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. As a pastor, I am always looking for some new way to skin a cat. But don't worry, no actual cats will be harmed during this sermon introduction. One of the cats that I've endeavored to skin in, in the past is how to effectively persuade church members to attend evening worship services. Now personally, I love evening worship and I feel lost without it. On those Sundays when we have bad weather, it just doesn't seem complete to me if you only have morning worship. And yet my preferences don't seem to be all that persuasive to other people. Then it dawned on me one day that evening worship is really not just my personal preference. For as we see in our passage today, not only were believers gathered together that evening of the Lord's Day, but Jesus came into their midst and met with them. His appearance filled them with joy even as it relieved them of their fears. 
It was during that evening worship service that Jesus breathed his Holy Spirit upon them and gave them peace. Now, this seems to me much more persuasive. Indeed, I think it is powerfully persuasive to say that Jesus Christ delights to meet with his people during the evening hours of the Lord's Day. He is present with us in worship, both in the morning and in the evening. And if we have an opportunity to meet with our risen, victorious, ascended Savior as day is dying in the West, why would we not do that? Why would we not take advantage of that opportunity? So our passage here this morning gives at least some support for the practice of the church meeting for worship on Sunday evenings. But it says much more than that. Indeed, it says much about Jesus and his appearance to his disciples. So as we walk about the text this morning, I want to first focus on a necessary appearance. Then we're going to look at a necessary gift. And finally, a necessary commission. Well, that first day of the week had been a doozy, that's for sure. Early in the morning, the, the women had come to the disciples with an unbelievable story. They said Jesus was not in the tomb. They reported that angels had said he was risen. And then Peter and John had confirmed the basic facts of the matter by running to the tomb and investigating themselves. Then later in the day, came reports that Jesus had appeared to several different people, including Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, and the two on the road to Emmaus. And now they met together as the disciples to consider these things. At the same time, there was an active fear among them of the Jewish authorities. Jesus had been arrested, tried, condemned, and executed. Were they next? Would the soldiers track them down and put them into prison? This is not an irrational fear on the part of the disciples, as the book of Acts will demonstrate. The Jews of Jerusalem were riding high, and they had the power to make life very difficult for the fledgling church. So the doors to their meeting room were shut and locked tight that evening as they sat within discussing the incredible day they had all just had. And then suddenly, suddenly, without any warning, Jesus is standing in their midst. Luke tells us that they were startled and frightened at his appearance, thinking that they were seeing a spirit. How had he gotten through the locked doors? How had he even found them? Certainly they had not advertised their meeting place. And then even after he showed them his hands and feet and side, they still could not believe it. This was simply too good to be true. Jesus, risen from the dead, could it be? Could they allow themselves to believe that he was indeed alive? So how did Jesus' physical body pass through locked doors without being noticed. Normally, a person would need to knock on the door to get the attention of those inside. He would need to convince them that he was safe and that they could open the door to him without danger. But none of that happens. One minute he is not there, and the next minute, he stands in their midst. Although various naturalistic explanations have been offered, the only sound interpretation is this. His risen, glorified body 
had qualities and abilities that he had not earlier possessed. He can do things now in his glorified body that defy natural explanations. And yet it remains a true physical body. The marks on his wrists and his side are proof positive that this is Jesus. And the glorified Jesus is different, not like he was before. And so we too, when we are glorified on the last day, will have bodies like unto his glorious body. Now, a lot of times curious people want to know, what will life be like in eternity? What will it be like in the new heavens and the new earth? What will it be like to be glorified? And about the only good answer we can give is, say, is to say, take a look at Jesus and what he does with his glorified body. That's the only real clue that we have. It will be different. It won't be exactly the same. Now, I said that this was a necessary appearance. And what I mean is this. It was vital for the disciples that they actually see him and examine his hands, his side, and his feet. It was crucial to convince them beyond any doubt that he was alive. And we see this even in their initial response. They think they're seeing a ghost. They think he's a spirit. They need to know. Their curiosity needs to be satisfied that this is a physically resurrected Christ. So when he ate the piece of fish in their presence, they knew beyond all doubt that he was not just spiritually alive, as a ghost would be, but he was physically resurrected, and that he stood bodily in their presence. So to convince them, this was necessary. It was also necessary in order to make them eyewitnesses of his resurrection. They could say, we have seen it with our own eyes, we have touched it with our own hands, we have beheld him we were there, and we speak as unimpeachable eyewitnesses of the resurrection. <clears throat> Apart from this, they would be merely repeating what others had said. And this comes from their own lips. They had seen it with their own eyes, felt it with their own hands. They knew he was alive. Now, there is something really important about eyewitnesses, something important about their firsthand information. This was illustrated this weekend in Washington, D.C., as they had the March for Life. And the conservative commentator that I mentioned before, Ben Shapiro, was in the news because, According to the media, he said that he would not even abort baby Hitler. And that was just a horrendous, horrible thing for anyone to possibly say. But if you take the second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand reporting of the media and trust that to be a good, clear uh, explanation of what went on, you're just missing the boat. Thankfully, they had the complete audio and video of what he said, his whole speech, because everything he does is televised. <laughs> and if you take it in the context and you see what was said in the whole speech, it was nothing like what the media were, were reporting. Eyewitnesses can say, look, I was there for the whole thing. I saw it. I touched it. I smelled it. I was present. I know and you don't have to rely on the edited version of secondary tertiary witnesses. And so this is important to establish in their minds the reality of his resurrection, 
But it also is important to make them eyewitnesses because that's what the apostles were in the early church. They were eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Well, not only was his physical appearance necessary, but the gift that he gave them was needful. I'm tempted to say gifts in the plural, because there really are a cluster of things here. And yet all the benefits are inextricably connected to the chief and main gift. And that gift is the Holy Spirit. He is the chief gift. As Jesus stood among them, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And thus Jesus bestows the Spirit upon the apostles. Well, this is rather straightforward here in our passage. It has raised no little discussion, especially in light of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And the question is asked, how does this giving of the Spirit in John 20 relate to that event in Acts 2? Now everyone agrees that Pentecost is a definitive moment for the early church as the Spirit came upon the apostles and empowered the apostles to preach the gospel in various languages to the assembled crowd. From Pentecost onward, we see that the Spirit is present and active in and through the apostles. Everything changes at Pentecost. So what are we to make of this pre-Pentecost giving of the Spirit? This is obviously before Pentecost. What do we make of this account? Well, I won't bother you with the far-fetched theories that tend to collapse under their own weight, and there are thousands of theories. But I will tell you that the best way to understand this event is as a preview of the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. Now, we're familiar with previews. If you ever go to the movie theater, you're inundated with previews of all kinds of movies you probably want to miss. And do they give you the whole movie? Do they give you the storyline even? No, they don't. They give you images. They give you a sense of what's coming. They, they try and whet your appetite to say, you know, I'd really like to see Spider-Man beat Batman. And those previews are trying to get you to look forward, and they always have a date, coming March 2, so that you're putting it on your calendar. You're looking ahead. That's what this is. This is a preview of Pentecost. Carson calls it a kind of acted parable pointing forward to the full endowment still to come at Pentecost. And what he's getting at there is this. This is more than just a statement. This is kind of like a little mini drama. Did you notice how Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit? It's as if he is kind of gently blowing. <sighs> receive the Holy Spirit. Now, did he need to exhale in order for the Spirit to come to the apostles? No, of course not. It's not as if the Spirit physically comes out of Jesus' physical mouth. But by doing that, he is acting out for them that the Spirit is going to proceed from him to them. He is going to send out the Spirit and the Spirit is going to come upon them, and they, for their part, will receive what he has breathed out to them. And so in this little miniature parable, he is showing them what's going to happen 
when Pentecost comes, now if you think about Pentecost, do you remember what was the first indicator that something remarkable was happening? There was the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And isn't it interesting that the word spirit and the word wind are the same word in the original? So there's this sense that the spirit is being blown from heaven upon the disciples on earth, and this rushing wind comes down upon them as the spirit is coming to fill them. It's much like we see in the story of Samson, where the spirit came upon Samson, and then Samson goes and kills some Philistines. It's the power of the spirit coming upon the servant of God to do a mighty work. And Jesus is previewing it. He's acting it out. Now Carson goes on to argue that John has repeatedly developed these anticipating steps in his narrative. It is not surprising that he uses one more to show that the story does not end with this book. So by using these previews, these anticipating steps, he is pushing his reader to the, to the future, helping the reader to look forward with anticipation. Now, I use anticipating steps in my sermons. I do this every sermon. Go back and listen to all the audio. You'll see this is the pattern I use. After my introduction, I give you the three points I'm going to cover. And that is to give you a sense of where we're at and where we're going in this sermon. And it is helping you to understand, okay, we've finished point one, we're going on to point two, because now there's a different idea we've got to work on for a while. And then point three is going to continue us on and bring us to the conclusion. And by announcing those, I'm helping you to look forward, hopefully to the rest of the sermon, not to the end of the sermon, but to, to look ahead. Because I want to help you to track with me along these different ideas that we're going to focus on and cover. And that's what John's doing, and he's done this before. He puts things early in the, uh, the gospel that then point us and lead us through and bring us to the end. And, and so there's all kinds of literary helps that he's giving. It's a preview to help you look forward. Well, as he gives the Spirit, he also bestows peace. When he first appeared that evening, he said to them, Peace be with you. And then he says again, after he's shown them his hands and his side, Peace be with you. These are men who needed peace, who needed the calm, the rest, the shalom that he alone can provide. Their hearts were anxious with many things. They had seen him arrested, tried, beaten, and crucified. They had observed his dead body hanging on the cross. But now on this first day of the week, their whole world had been turned absolutely upside down again with these reports of his resurrection. And if that were not enough, the fear of the Jews added one more stress atop all their other stresses. There was commotion. These men were in turmoil. They needed peace his peace. They needed a peace that would calm their hearts down so they could beat normally again. So his giving of peace is the need of the hour. And whenever we find ourselves in turmoil, whenever we are just upset about any number of things, his peace comes to us. And it settles us. And it gives us rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, 
and I will give you rest. And so he's very attentive to their needs at that hour. And yet there is something even more profoundly important about his gift of peace. Listen to Ryle. He says, peace, we may safely conclude, was intended by our Lord to be the keynote of the Christian ministry. That same peace, which was so continually on the lips of the master, was to be the grand subject of the teaching of his disciples. Peace between God and man through the precious blood of atonement. Peace between man and man through the infusion of grace and charity. To spread such peace as this was to be the work of the church. Have you ever thought of the gospel, the ministry of the church, the work of the church in these terms? About bringing peace to men. A peace between God and man, which can only be achieved through the atonement. A peace between man and man as grace intervenes and softens heart, and reconciles enemies. We are to be agents of peace. To be spreading peace throughout the world is the work of the church. Now, sadly, and this goes back 50, 60 years ago, the whole concept of peace has been hijacked by the hippies and their followers. And if you remember, if you were alive in the 70s, <laughs> I won't ask you to raise your hand if you were alive in the 70s, but what was the, the thing? It was peace, man, peace. And the peace symbol was big marketing. And everything was about peace and peace. And the, the left has grabbed onto peace as if peace is its domain. And we go right up into the current day, and what do you find the, the characterization? Liberals are for peace, and conservatives are for war. And that old tune continues to get play in our culture today. And it's almost as if, you know, you have to be a, a, an atheistic, um, nature-worshipping, radical leftist to be at all interested in peace. And if you're a bona fide conservative, if you love God and country, you want nothing of peace. Let's kill our enemies. But, but you see, that's just a hijacking, a historic hijacking of the Christian concept. And the Christian concept of peace is just, let's not have any more wars so people don't hurt each other anymore. It's not just the absence of conflict. That's not peace. That's a truce. We want no truces. But we bring the message of peace from the Prince of Peace that says, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. You can find peace with God. And you can live at peace with your neighbor. And Christianity is all about peace. Not left-wing liberal. Real, bona fide, substantial peace. And so the peace that Jesus gives is not just a momentary circumstantial thing for his disturbed disciples on that night. It's an abiding, enduring aspect of their work to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. They are to be ambassadors of peace to a world that is in constant turmoil. Only the gospel can bring such peace so that men can honestly say, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The left cannot produce that. Neither can the right. Only, only 
through the gospel delivered by the church, can peace come to the world. And this becomes the watchword for the apostolic ministry. How many of the New Testament books do not open with these words, grace to you and peace through God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ? That is how the apostles greet the church. Grace to you and peace. So as we step back from it, these two things should really be viewed as two parts of one whole. The gift of the Holy Spirit and the bestowal of peace. The Spirit brings peace and he makes peace a reality between God and man between man and man. So his bodily appearance was necessary. His gift of the spirit and of peace was necessary. But it was also necessary that he give them a commission. Because without a commission, they would remain private individuals with no authorization to speak or to act in the name of heaven. And Jesus makes this plain to the disciples in verse 21 when he says, As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Here is a commission that empowers the apostles to function as Christ's ambassadors. Well, like too many other things in this altogether brief passage. These words of Jesus in verse 21 have opened a debate in certain circles. Surprising how many debates can spring from such a simple, clear passage. So the debate goes along these lines. Is the mission of the church entirely, exactly, completely the same as that of Jesus, or is the mission of the church analogous to Jesus' mission? Now, it seems to me that it is the height of presumption to assume that our mission completely, exactly corresponds to Jesus' mission. He came as God incarnate. He came to live a perfect life, and to achieve full righteousness. He came to die as a sacrificial substitute for guilty sinners. He's the Lamb of God who makes atonement. And I just wonder, how could we do that? That is so far beyond anything we could even attempt. So the church's mission is not to make atonement, nor is it to secure the forgiveness of sinners through our own personal suffering. But rather, our mission is analogous in certain senses to Jesus' mission. So we are commissioned from heaven, just as Jesus was. As the Father sent me, so send I you. The message that we proclaim is the same message Jesus proclaimed. We are relying on the Spirit to work just as Jesus relied on the Spirit to work. And the result of the mission is transformed lives, just as Jesus sought to transform lives. It's not like Jesus' mission in every respect. It can't be. But in certain ways, it is analogous. It is much like and so the gospel that we proclaim is really rooted in Jesus' redemptive work on the cross. We are preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that is the mission of the church. Now, many, day, many things go on these days under the guise of missions. And I'm not here to say that any of these things are in and of themselves bad things. I'll use my parents as an example. They went down for years to the Dominican Republic to do medical clinics with the Luke Society. 
and my mom's a nurse, and my dad would go along as just a general helper. And they would see thousands of people in Dominican Republic who needed medical care, and that medical care was extended to them in the name of Christ. And medical care is good. Now, I could say this. Raise your hand if you think medical care is good. Yeah, I think it's good. And medical care for people who can't afford it, that's good. Doing so in the name of Christ, that's commendable. But it's no substitute for preaching the gospel. You can't say, we will just have a soup kitchen where we're going to serve excellent soups. We're going to serve a great variety of soups. Some vegetarian soups, some soups for carnivores. Soup, 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 soup. Well, great. Soup is wonderful. But it's not the gospel. The gospel, Jesus Christ and him crucified, that is what we are to preach. That is at the heart of our mission. And all of those other good things that have their place are fine and dandy as long as we don't substitute them for the preaching of the clear gospel of Christ. So the apostles were sent forth by Christ armed with a gospel to proclaim to a lost world of sinners. They went forth in and through the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming peace to all men. And as they did, they had the divine authority to declare the forgiveness or the retention of sins. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. And so using the ministerial and declarative power of the church, forgiveness is proclaimed authoritatively to those who repent and put their trust in Christ. And likewise, sins are retained for those who refuse to repent and will not turn to the Savior. So as the gospel is preached, it comes with authority. Authority to open and to shut, to forgive sins, or to retain sins. Now please understand, this is not the Roman Catholic practice of absolution. I, as a minister, do not have a power vested in me by virtue of my ordination that I can forgive your sins. But what this does say is that in the preaching of the gospel, God's servants are opening the door and proclaiming the forgiveness of sins to those who repent and believe. But it is also shutting the door to those who will not repent and do not believe. So this isn't just an exercise in public speaking, which you can take it or leave it if you prefer it or not so much. It's not like I'm standing up here reading the phone book to you or reciting statistics from the Packers season this year. I'm proclaiming the gospel, and I'm calling upon you to repent and believe. And if you do, if you are, if you have done that, I'm telling you, on the authority of God's word, your sins are forgiven. But if, on the other hand, you're closing your heart to the gospel, if you're saying, how long can he go on? When will this be over? I am so tired of this that I have to tell you, your sins are retained upon you. And if you were to die leaving the parking lot today, you would go to hell forever. This is serious stuff. This is eternal stuff. Because just as joyfully I can proclaim the forgiveness of the sins of repentant believers, I also have a duty to tell unbelievers and the unrepentant, you're still in your sins, and if you're to die in your sins, there is a horrific hell that awaits you, that will swallow you up 
and the fire will never go out, and the worm will never die, and you will suffer eternally. And so this commission is huge. This is so important. The church is like any other, unlike any other institution in this world. I was recently reminded of something I had forgotten, uh, thankfully forgotten, that Frank Reich, Reich, I think that's how you pronounce it, is the coach of the Indianapolis Colts, who did pretty well in the playoffs this year. You know what Frank Reich used to do? He used to be the president of RTS. And recently there was a story celebrating Coach Reich for his successful campaign with the Colts and saying it's great that he's pursuing a career in coaching professional football and has laid the ministry aside. And thankfully, some people have said, this is horrible. This is horrible. A minister of the gospel who is involved in training young men for the ministry, he has not taken a step up or even a step sideways. He's taken a huge step down. It is such a privilege to be involved in the ministry at the commission of Christ himself. Well, this mission given to the apostles 2,000 years ago continues to be the mission of the church today. And this is why we are here in Sheboygan County. We are here to preach and to proclaim the good news, to turn men from sin and unto the living God. God has assigned us this place at this time. He has given us his Holy Spirit for this work. And we need to understand that this is our mission. It is our mission to be here as God's representatives. Do we understand that God has placed us here by his will for this purpose at this hour? And are we committed to fulfilling his plan for us through the power of his spirit? This is why we exist. This is what we are to be about. And this is how God will use us, perhaps to gloriously change lost sinners and to bring them to himself. Let's pray. Father, give us the grace, the strength, and the determination to fulfill this mission to proclaim this good news of Christ. Use us, Lord, and through us bring yourself honor and glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.